Welcome to the first episode of Photo Geek Weekly, recorded on November 6th, 2017. I'm your host, Don Komarechka, and this podcast aims to cover photographic news with a geeky and technical twist uh, that I know many photographers will enjoy. Uh, so today I'm going to go over a couple of interesting stories over the past few weeks, because we can start off with a bang. Uh, and uh, this includes the updates to Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom, among their other applications the fate of the QXD memory card format and why you should care even if you don't use it. And finally, uh, a strange relaunch of the Yashica camera brand with a product that honestly just has me scratching my head. So, so let's dive into it, starting off with the Adobe updates. Um, this has me a little bit bothered because at first I was all for the subscription model that Adobe puts forward where uh, you know, for $10 a month, photographers can get the full version of Photoshop and the full version of Lightroom, where the barrier to entry for Photoshop uh, specifically, the full version used to cost around $1,000. Um, and now $10 a month lets you just dive right in and, uh, uh, and continue using that in the Adobe ecosystem. So the problem is when you make a subscription model, you completely de-incentivize uh, de yourself from any uh, like revolutionary updates. You, you are not competitive anymore. There's no more innovation because you already have people subscribing. All you have to do is update it enough so that people continue to subscribe. And uh, this is notable in these updates as well. There are some improvements for photographers, but they are minimal. Uh, number one, I really enjoyed how they rolled out their Pre uh, Preserve Details 2.0, which is a take on um, upscaling an image using more fractal algorithms, very similar to uh, what On1 has with their perfect resize. And I've tried the two side by side, and they're actually pretty comparable, um, which means on one might have to up their game and uh, come up with something even better to outdo Photoshop. So I do enjoy the competition there. Uh, but even if you never use perfect resize, you've got that baked into Photoshop right now. So if you've got a really low resolution photograph or something that you just want to upscale to uh, a higher resolution for printing purposes, that's already pretty good, but you want to make a giant image for your wall, then the uh, Preserve Details 2.0 would come in handy, um, especially if you're a photographer that does printing. So I'm happy about that one for sure. Um, and those people with a, um, a camera that can shoot spherical panoramas, the ability to edit those natively in Photoshop with all of the tools and filters you're used to uh, now exists. So there are some definite steps forward there. And one that I'm actually surprised took this long to, uh, to, to come to fruition is the ability to copy and paste layers, um, which I've had to do from time to time, especially if I'm taking uh, something that has a layer mask and possibly even uh, blending modes associated with it and wanting to move that from one image to another. Uh, previously, I would have to break out a window uh, from the, the main flow of all the Photoshop tabs. And once it's separated, I can drag that layer onto another image in a different window, and that would effectively copy and paste it, and then I can reposition it. But now, it's as simply as making sure that there's no active selection, and go copy and paste uh, on the keyboard Command or Control C, uh, and then Command or Control V, will very easily copy the layer, all of its attributes, um, a layer mask, everything all just goes immediately to the new layer. It's fantastic, it's easy, I just don't know why it wasn't there before. Um, and there, there's also a lot of small stuff under the hood, uh, font stuff, uh, selection stuff, including improvements to uh, the, um, the uh, AI algorithm, Adobe calls it deep learning, but the artificial intelligence algorithms uh, for better face uh, detection uh, in face aware liquify. So uh, some great improvements there, but I'm left a little bit disappointed. Again, the subscription model doesn't help me create something uh, better. The, the tools are more efficient, sure. Um, but even from a time uh, standpoint, how much time it takes me to save a file, it's still the same for the very large files. And for a reason why I, I just I can't put my finger on it, why it hasn't been done, if I want to save multiple files at the same time, I can't. Uh, if I hit the save button, one will finish, then the next one will pick up, and the next one will pick up. And it seems like something that's very easy to be multi-threaded, um, and it's just not there. Uh, I've studied software development to some degree, and I know how complex uh, software like Photoshop is, but this seems like a really easy uh, time-saving fix for people. Um, even I can't save the same file twice. If I wanted to save a um, 
a master high resolution version uh, of the uh, of the file, and then while that's saving, make a lower resolution version as a JPEG uh, using the traditional uh, file save mechanism. It will disallow me. It'll say a save operation is already in progress, even though I'm trying to save to a completely different file. Um, and the file saving process is single threaded, which from a bit of research that I did, I understand that some of that can be multi threaded, especially if I'm saving an image as a um, as a TIFF with zip compression, that can take a long time if I'm dealing with a very big file. Um, and I look at uh, my CPU usage, and it's just a single core. And I have multiple cores. Photoshop just doesn't use them. So there is some fundamental stuff in Photoshop that needs fixing, which, thankfully, if we go into Lightroom, some of the fundamental brokenness of, uh, of Lightroom has now been addressed. And in the newest version, Lightroom uh, Classic CC, as they're calling it, is no longer broken as much as it was. Previously, I couldn't even use it anymore, and I was actively seeking an alternative. Um, I hate to say that the best new feature in a product is the fact that it's no longer broken. Uh, I, I don't agree with that as a, as a strategy, but it's now usable again. Uh, the time to switch from image to image, especially if the images had a lot of local adjustments to them, was between 10 and 30 seconds in some cases. It got so bad, I even opened up a, a new Lightroom catalog, which would allow me to quickly go through a new import, and then I would take that information and add that back into my main catalog once I was done. Uh, now I don't think I'll have to do that anymore, which is great. Uh, beside those performance issues being addressed, and some people are still having bugs and other problems that they need to, uh, to, to sort out, the only new thing that I can even talk about is uh, range masking. And this, I brought up to Adobe, there was a Q&A session many years, I think it was 2012 or 2013, and uh, there was a new release of Lightroom that was just coming out at the time, and I asked a question that I thought was a, a pretty simple one, and it was well answered at the time. I asked uh, Tom Hogarty and, and the team, um, is it possible, is, is it technically possible for you to have hue saturation and luminance adjustments associated with a local adjustment, um, whichever local adjustment it would happen to be. Because that's one of the things that I kept going to Photoshop for, to use the hue and saturation adjustment uh, that allowed me to do that as a layer mask. And uh, at the time, this is five years ago, they said, no, there's no technical reason why we can't do that. Um, and then subsequent versions of Lightroom never included it. And now the range masking feature is a pretty novel way of introducing that, either based on color or luminosity, to a specific region that you can pick uh, with the eyedropper to choose the colors that you want to affect. So um, we have that now, finally. Uh, and I know that I will find some way to use that in my workflow as time goes on. Um, I also noticed that the uh, the process is now process version 4, uh, which says current, versus process version 3, which was back in 2012. And maybe it's the uh, range masking. Um, it, they also made a note about better noise reduction with auto masking and, and a few other little tweaks here and there that uh, probably designate this new process version. But I worry, because if those are so minimal, and we've jumped up to a new process version that took us five or six years to get here now, will we be stuck for another five years before Adobe decides to change the core engine that edits our photographs? Uh, or will it be a quicker succession, maybe two or three years down the road? I think the answer to that comes with the competition, because if you have, and, and I know that Capture One is great, Luminar, uh, they've just announced a digital asset manager that is looking very, very promising. Heck, there's even Corel Aftershot Pro, uh, which I haven't personally used myself, but I know some people that uh, talk about, and they say, you know, there's not a big user base here, but it's a great product um, in terms of software that can manage my catalog of images. And let's not forget about On One's Photo Raw and DxO Optics Pro, which I also own, um, and they're great raw processors. People are looking at alternatives for Lightroom. And I, as much as I love what it is, the market share needs to decrease in order for Adobe to have a fire lit under them in order to step up their game. Uh, I think that these enhancements are great, but they still fall far short of what I would want the software to be. Um, Looking at uh, the alternatives, one of the reasons why I haven't jumped uh, is because a lot of my work, especially in macro photography, uh, I need to select multiple images that I can send to Photoshop as layers. And Lightroom can do that wonderfully. 
the alternative would be to export multiple images as TIFF files, then load up Bridge. And from Bridge, there's the ability to bring them in as layers in Photoshop uh, for, for that side of things. But I want a simplified workflow. I don't want things to be more complicated. And I, I honestly, I hate having to relearn something that already works that I just wish worked a little bit better. So Lightroom has some very basic enhancements. Photoshop, again, I'm being let down on some things. But there is a push forward. Um, I feel funny to say that this software is only going to get better the more people abandon it, uh, because that's the only thing that's really going to force Adobe forward. And they're making uh, some very strong moves to prevent people from doing that, which is the whole uh, motif around Lightroom CC, uh, where, for those that uh, are unfamiliar with the new delineation of Lightroom Classic CC and what's now called Lightroom CC, Lightroom CC is designed to have all of your images placed in the cloud. And uh, this is great for certain photographers that are not me, because I've got a huge NAS array that has you know, 16, uh, 17 terabytes worth of information that I like to have at my fingertips. And there's no pricing model from Adobe that would let me throw that into the cloud affordably. And even if there was, the problem is once you have all of your images not only loaded up in Adobe software, but held on Adobe servers, they've got you. You're not going to go anywhere else uh, unless you have, like, you do a massive upchange of pulling all of your data back down, finding someplace to store it locally if you don't have the uh, the space already, finding a new cloud-based service, or keeping a, a hard copy of it as you might transition to uh, to new software tools, and the ability to change to jump from one platform to another uh, will become much, much more difficult if you go in uh, whole hog into this new Lightroom CC platform. And Adobe knows that. That's why they're doing it, uh, so that they will keep you subscribed because you have no easy way out. There's no quick switch to say, OK, well, now I'm just going to use Luminar instead of Lightroom. And uh, then you can just jump on over. Your decision process would have to be, well, I want to use Luminar, but now I have to pull all of my images out of Adobe's grasp and find some place where I can store them uh, with the new software able to access properly. Or even if Adobe opens up the ability for other applications to access your images on the cloud, which I hope that they would do, um, you're still using Adobe service, and you're still paying Adobe. So uh, smart marketing for them, but it's a scary time for photographers that are looking at the subscription model and seeing where that rabbit hole goes. So uh, I hope for better things from Adobe, uh, but I'm eagerly looking at every other player in the industry uh, to see what they can bring forward to not only manage, but edit my images better, more efficiently, and save time. Um, there's only so much of that in a day. So I, I want to mention before we go on to, to the next story that uh, this podcast uh, has currently no sponsors, but I would like to have some support of people that enjoy uh, listening. And we've signed up for a Patreon account. So you can go to our website uh, and go to uh, the Patreon link right on there and uh, give us a few dollars. If you enjoy the content, it'll keep this going. It'll keep the lights on. It'll keep me well caffeinated and uh, ready to go on from week to week. And hopefully, if there's enough support there, um, then additional content will be available exclusively to people uh, that pitch in and help make it all happen. So um, thanks for anybody that's considering doing that uh, and clicking your way there right now. Uh, and if not, well, I hope you still enjoy the content. It's free, and I intend for it to always be that way. Um, the next story is uh, some interesting notes on the QXD memory card format, because uh, there was two players in this game. Um, SanDisk was supposed to be one when the format was announced, although they never came out with any products. And that left Lexar and Sony as the only two people that were producing the QXD format that's been used in uh, many high-end Nikon cameras, the Sony F7, I think, um, and a few other bits and pieces uh, around. But the Nikon, the D850, the uh, D4, and D5, they all support the uh, uh, this uh, memory card format that's much faster than the compact flash format. Well. Lexar, uh, the brand, was sold from its parent company, Micron, and it's now owned by a Chinese manufacturer, Longsys, who I'd never heard of uh, before this, um, this purchase. So there were rumors that the format would be dropped from Lexar's lineup, and uh, for a, a short period of time, it was. It's now back, and they are stating that there was some packaging issues, um, and uh, they will be back on the market very soon. Which is interesting, because it made me look at the competing 
cards, the um, the successors to the compact flash card, which is a really, really old format. Um, the UDMA 7, I think, uh, compact flash card format was finalized in 2010, so that's seven years ago. And that's the fastest compact flash card you're going to get. That maxes out at one, uh, 167 megabytes per second. So you'll see cards that say, you know, we get up to 160 megabytes per second on compact flash. You're never going to see a card that can state a number higher than that. That's the maximum for the format. And so we needed to find successors to that using some more modern technology. The compact flash format uses the same protocol as the, uh, the IDE hard drives uh, in older computers. In fact, they're they're uh, mechanically compatible if you just get a pin adapter. And if you were to attach that to an old computer, it would see it just as a hard drive. And they use them in uh, embedded systems for quite a while. But if you want to come up with a new memory card format, uh, the concept would be to look to a new uh, standard, a new protocol for transferring data that's used in computers and adapt that to the memory cards that our cameras uh, are using. So um, the first one was CFAST, and that's currently used in high-end Canon cameras, uh, both on the photo and video side. And CFAST cards use the serial ATA uh, protocol that can go up to 600 uh, megabytes per second. And you'll see that the memory cards on the market right now are hitting very close to that. They will label you know, 500 and something megabytes per second as their maximum throughput. And I'm sure there's a little bit of overhead um, with the transfer of that data that prevents it from getting a little bit higher. Um, so the, the CFAST memory card format has hit its maximum uh, in its second revision. And I don't think that there's any, uh, any hope that there will be a new successor to serial ATA, uh, new uh, enhancement of that protocol. It is where it is. And so the CFAST format has reached its end as well. Um, QXD cards, getting back to that topic, uh, use a different protocol. They use the PCI Express bus, which is much faster. Uh, that maxes out right now at around a gigabyte a second. I don't think the cards are quite there yet, but the protocol maxes out at, at that, uh, uh, that bandwidth. And so that's more than enough for today. But how can we push forward? Because the next format is going to come out. Um, and I don't know if the QXD format is going to be long for this world either. Uh, all of these formats that I've just mentioned, if we need more bandwidth than a gigabyte a, uh, a second, and who knows when that time might come when we're shooting rapid fire 100 megapixel images um, or shooting 8K video, this becomes a very real thing within the next five to 10 years. And uh, the next format is uh, CF Express which is also a compact, uh, a compact flash successor. It uses the PCI Express bus, uh, just like QXD does, but it uses the NVMe uh, protocol to do so, the non-volatile memory express, which is what the highest end desktop um, SSDs attached uh, in, like in, a, in a slot are going to be using right now. And the current format is up to two gigabytes a second uh, with potential as you open up more PCI Express lanes uh, in future revisions to be eight gigabytes a second and maybe even more than that. And that is a growing standard. That's an active, pursuable standard um, that is on the cutting edge of computer technology. The problem is the lead time between a standard being announced and available uh, and it being integrated in a product is often four or five years before the first commercial product is available. Delkin is making uh, CF Express cards and they're the only one. Uh, the first reader for that format only comes out in December of this year. And if a product manufacturer like Sony or Nikon or Canon um, that have been ad uh, adopting some of these newer formats wants to use this, the product has to be in the early stages of the design pipeline right now. And so who knows how long that's going to take to come to market. So we are at a bit of a crossroads here where the, the new next gen standards are actually quickly becoming obsolete because they have hit their maximum throughput. Uh, and the newest standards uh, in CF Express, well, we're not quite there yet either. So um, it's interesting. I've got CFast cards for my Canon. I've got a, a, a 1DX Mark II. And they use that format, and they're, I think it's 540 megabytes per second, which is more than that camera ever needs. I can shoot raw and hold my finger on the shutter button, and it won't fill the buffer. It'll fill the memory card first, um, which is great. That's where we want to be, and we want to make sure that the formats live up to that moving forward, because who knows what the next camera is that's twice or three times the resolution at the same frame rate. Will it keep up as much? Probably not, unless the bandwidth goes up on those cards. Um, so long story short, QXD cards are still being manufactured by Lexar uh, and by Sony, um, but uh, look 
to the future because the next formats are getting really exciting when CF Express comes out. Um, we're probably going to see that in about five years in, uh, in those higher end cameras. So something to look forward to at the very least. So from the cutting edge of technology, uh, here's an interesting story. The Yashica brand, which is uh, also now owned by a Chinese holding company, um, they've decided to bring the brand back with a, they call it the Digifilm Y35 camera. And this caught my attention almost with a bit of a face palm because uh, they're bringing this 14 megapixel digital camera that in order to change the settings of the camera, you have to open up the back of it like a film camera, load in a canister that looks like film that is going to change the camera settings to be uh, a different ISO, to make it black and white and grainy. Uh, there's some unusual blue mode that they have on a new module as well. Um, and the camera itself is very simple. It's got a mechanical, uh, you know, uh, a film advance uh, and a shutter button, but everything else is pretty much, uh, for the most part, controlled by that film canister that goes inside. They're talking about an f2.0 lens, but they're mentioning uh, nothing about it actually having aperture blades or being able to be changed. So everybody's assuming at this point that it's a fixed f2.0 aperture, which could cause some problems, uh, and there's no mention of autofocus in any way. So that means it could be a fixed focus lens, um, which at that kind of an aperture would be a challenge. Uh, we don't know all the details of that technology just yet, but I think it's safe to say that there are a lot of question marks and a lot of red flags, but why? Why, <laughs> why should this product exist? If you want to use a film camera, use a film camera. Uh, if you want to use a digital camera that feels like a film camera, um, there are some out there. Uh, but to be honest, if you listen to music on a vinyl LP, that's that's an experience that you have. You know, you listen to the songs all in sequence on the album as they were intended to be. I don't do that. It's not my thing. But I know a lot of people respect that medium and enjoy the experience as it is. You wouldn't get the same experience if you were to take those vinyl LPs, and they've got devices that'll do that, stream them to MP3s, and you can listen them, uh, to them on your phone. Um, would you do that? I, the only reason why, I think, would be if you didn't want to repurchase the music. But it ruins the original experience, and I think that's what this camera, uh, this Y35, is also in the same boat doing. And it's funny, because the, the DX encoding format, which is the, the little uh, electrical contacts that you would find on a film canister that would tell the camera what ISO uh, the film was and how many frames you were uh, able to, to shoot on that roll. And I think even uh, something about the, the, uh, the latitude uh, that the film had was all programmable on that uh, little canister. That, that came out in 1986. This is not exactly new technology. Um, Novel to adapt it to controlling a digital camera, I suppose. Um, but here's a better idea. If you have an old film camera and you want to modify that to take digital photographs, there's actually another Kickstarter campaign out there at the moment uh, called I'm Back, and I'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes to this, that basically creates an attachment. Uh, so long as your camera has a removable back on it, um, it places a focusing screen over the film plane and then uses a Raspberry Pi and a camera to take a picture of the focusing screen. So you're digitizing it automatically. There's a little screen on the back and everything. And yeah, it's not gonna be great. It's, uh, you know, it's a 16 megapixel camera, but you're limited by the resolution of the focusing screen. It's a bit of a kludge, but you'd be using a wonderfully engineered antique uh, camera that has the flair that, you know, if you're a hipster, that's what you're after, I suppose, at the end of it. And you're getting digital images uh, at the same time. The uh, Yashica Y35 camera will cost you around 170 bucks US. This I'm back, uh, digital back for a 35 millimeter camera is around $200 US to get one fully assembled and much less if you want pieces to put it together yourself. Um, so there's a, a few interesting ideas out there um, that kind of keep the nostalgia alive. But then I'm left asking the question, why, why don't you just shoot film? because there's a lot of, uh, there's more film emulsions coming out on the market every day. In fact, um, 
Russian company Silbera uh, currently has an Indiegogo campaign, uh, and they're crowdfunding new black and white emulsions. They got about six or seven uh, different films out there with lower ISOs. I think the highest is 200, um, and very very high detail. Some panchromatic, some orthochromatic. Um, the uh, the latter having um, no sensitivity to red, which is important for some uh, some purposes. Um, and black and white film development at home is simple. It's easy. I've done it a number of times myself, um, and it requires very little investment in terms of equipment, just a bit of time, and then scan it. Heck, I've even built an adapter, I don't have it handy right now, um, that uh, I can screw onto the front of my macro lens that will hold the, um, uh, the, the sheet of film, or the, uh, the frame of film, rather, at exactly the working distance on my macro lens at one-to-one. -one. And I can take a photograph of that against my computer monitor displaying just pure white, and now I've got a digital version of that that I just have to invert in Photoshop if it's a black and white uh, or uh, whatever software you're using. And then now it becomes part of my digital workflow without me having to invest even in a scanner. Um, the adapter I uh, I bought the parts cost me about eight dollars or so uh, in order to build that with some cheap uh, five dollar extension tubes off of eBay and some tie clips and some craft leather and some glue. Uh, it's a really simple apparatus to construct. Maybe I'll put together an article on how to do that. But um, the idea is I can take an old film camera, shoot on very good film, and keep that entire feel through that process. So to me, I don't know, this, this seems like it's dead in the water, but they've made uh, one and a, a quarter million dollars US in funding. Uh, and it's going ahead through multiple revisions. They've hit one uh, of their uh, uh, goals of getting a, uh, a lens from f2.8 to f2. The next is a slightly larger sensor size. And I, I wish them well, but this product is an anachronism. Um, it, it is something from an old time that is trying to be new and interesting, but we have so many other ways, especially for the cost, $170 US. You could go out and buy a really good film camera with an exceptional lens for half of that um, and have all of the full controls and heck, adapt it to be a digital camera or like uh, me, I've got my grandfather's old Canon AE-1 that is uh, sitting in a display case behind me and I would really like to, to take that camera out and use it some more. So maybe I get a digital back for it, maybe I just get some new film and, uh, and embrace that experience because honestly that's what this camera is all about uh, but it's going about it the wrong way. Um, so those are the first three stories for uh, Photo Geek Weekly. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks very much for listening uh, to this inaugural episode. Uh, if you enjoyed the show and you'd like to support us, like I mentioned, we've set up a Patreon account. And we also have a tip jar on our website if you want to make a one-time donation, which would be greatly appreciated over at photogeekweekly.com. Uh, and if you'd like to suggest any stories uh, for discussion and have any feedback whatsoever, feel free to write us at info at photogeekweekly.com uh, or find a contact form on our website as well. So until next time, pick up your camera and shoot.